Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. Now, if you'd like to receive a weekly email about past and upcoming shows, you can subscribe to our now called Myeloma Crowd newsletter on the homepage or take a look or, or follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. And please feel free to share these interviews with your myeloma friends. Now, we'd rec- like to, before we get started with our show today, we have a couple of things we'd like to tell you about. Um, first, we'd like to have you take a look at the Myeloma Crowd. We've had several patients participate, including Karen Crowley and Liz Smith. Um, it is a growing and very now vibrant website that's trying to provide the best information for myeloma patients from all sorts of resources around the world. So we're very grateful for patients who are pitching in to help build this site and contribute to it. And we would like to invite you to contribute as well. Uh, We have a doctor directory, and um, on that site we are in full support of the Dana Holmes Mambo for Myeloma campaign. We'd like to also tell you about a new music contest that we have going called Songs for Life. This is a new contest to support research for to support research for uh, for myeloma. So please take a look at the posts about this, and um, we would we would love to have you socialize this with your musician friends to get a donation for um, for myeloma research. Now on today's show we have we are very very fortunate to have with us today one of the for- foremost world leaders in multiple myeloma. Dr. Jesus San Miguel of the University of Navarra. And Dr. San Miguel, it looks like you are on you are live. Yes, I'm here. I'm so happy. <laughs> it adds no, a little really bit of complexity yeah, calling yeah, in that's internationally, that's but <laughs> we're just thrilled that you're here. Let me give a little introduction for you before we get started. Dr. Jesus San Miguel is a professor of medicine and director of clinical and translational medicine at the University of Navarra. He served as director of the hematology department of the University Hospital of Salamanca for over 22 years. He studied medicine at the University of Navarra, Spain, and completed his residency in hematology internal medicine at the University Hospital of Salamanca. In 1980, after obtaining his Ph.D., he undertook a postdoctoral fellowship at the Leukemia Unit at Hammersmith Hospital, the Royal Postgraduate Medical School in London. Professor San Miguel is president-elect of the International Myeloma Society, member of the Academy of Pharmacy of Castilla Leon, an honorary member to the Royal Academy of Medicine of Salamanca, as well as a member of the advisory board of the International Myeloma Foundation, the MMRF, the Carreras Foundation, and a board member of the Spanish Hematology and Genome Foundations. He's associate editor of Blood and was also associate editor of Hematologica. In addition, he's a member of the editorial board of several scientific journals. He served as director of the Biomedical Research Institute of Salamanca, vice director of the Cancer Research Center in Salamanca, and as chairman of the Spanish Myeloma Group. He was also the European Association Board Counselor and chairman of the Scientific Committee for the 9th Congress and president for the 15th EHA Congress. He organized the 9th International Myeloma Workshop held in Salamanca and has received numerous awards including the Waldenstrom Award in 2007, Walden, the, the Robert Kyle Lifetime Achievement Award, the EHA Jose Carreras Award, the Rey Jaime Uno on Medical Research Award, and Spanish Awards for Oncology and Translational Research. He's published over 600 original papers in international journals, and his areas of interest include myeloma, the biology of leukemic cells and their prognostic implications, and minimal residual disease. Dr. San Miguel, we are so honored. I consider this a great privilege to have you on the show today. No, it is my privilege just to be with you today. Well, you are relatively new to the University of Navarra, so maybe we begin 
by having us help understand what your goals for your new position are. And then um, maybe we can discuss the most recent International Myeloma Working Group, some of the findings there. Okay. Uh, you are correct. After uh, 30 years in in Salamanca and 22 as head of the, hem the hematology department in Salamanca that is in the uh, west part of Spain, I moved to the north to the University of as director of uh, clinical and translational medicine. And the goal of this uh, job, of this position, is to try to integrate what I had been doing in Salamanca for myeloma and hematology, but now for all the medicine, and is to integrate the research with the clinic and the teaching all together. And this is what I'm trying to do here. But in order to survive from such a bureaucratic job, I mm -hmm. always continue keeping the myeloma research and myeloma patients as part of the oxygen that I need to survive. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when I move it to uh, Pamplona, I uh, brought with me Dr. Bruno Paiva, that is a leader in minimal visual disease. Also, I got it again back to the, from Boston to Dr. Patricia Maiso and several other people that have uh, joined me to try to maintain and to uh, really to, 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 to continue improving the myeloma research. Apart from this, we continue a very, very tight a collaboration with all Salamanca team, Dr. Ocio Mateo, Sonal Gutierrez, etc., and the Spanish Myeloma Group. In fact, next week we have a meeting of the Spanish Myeloma Group, and I continue as a, one of the co-chairmen of the of the boards of directors. Well, it's wonderful, and we would expect nothing less. I know you have led the way in many areas, and I know this will be no different. So. Um, there were many people who were very impressed with the International Myeloma Working Group meeting that was held in Milan recently, I guess in the spring, and specifically for um, high risk. But I guess before we talk about that, maybe you, your specialty historically has been studying minimal residual disease, and I'm familiar with the Black Swan Research Project of the IMF. So maybe we begin by talking a little bit about that project and um, the importance of minimal residual disease testing. Okay, okay. This concept of minimal residual disease is a concept that was uh, rather old uh, in leukemia. In fact, in 1990s, I organized a meeting for minimal residual disease in acute lymphoblastic and acute myeloblastic leukemia. And the reason for that is because in these two types of leukemias, the rate of complete remission was high, around 60 or 80 percent, but some of these patients that achieve a complete response then subsequently relapse. If this occurs, this means that there were some residual cells responsible for that relapse. In the myeloma arena, this was not of interest in the 90s because to achieve a complete response by the then with the introduction of transplant, it became more frequent. And then at the late 90s, the introduction of novel drugs, the number of complete response significantly rise up. Mm -hmm. Then I thought that at that time, it was the right time just to start to think also in minimal residual disease. Because in other words, is, is the evaluation of occult disease under the level of detection of the conventional methods. And for myeloma, the conventional method for detection of disease are the morphology, the bone marrow examination by morphology, and the detection of the M component. Let me explain to you the morphology in the bone marrow. Okay. You and me, as healthy people, we have around 2-3% of plasma cells in our marrow. And these bone plasma cells are responsible for the production of the immunoglobulins, the antibodies. And this is critical because this part of 
of the defense against infections, etc. Then, then to have two or three percent of norm, uh, of normal plasma cell is extremely important. Okay, what mm -hmm. is the problem with multiple myeloma? The problem with multiple myeloma is that one of these is transform into malignant plasma cell and growth and growth. Then, if you treat appropriately a multiple myeloma patient, you will be able to eradicate most of the plasma cells. And if you evaluate a multiple myeloma patient that has received an appropriate treatment, for instance, induction with potassium and alidomide X, followed by transplant or not transplant, and you go and you examine the more marrow that a diagnosis included, for instance, 50% plasma cell of the total plasma cell, 50% of the total bone marrow, 50% were plasma cell. This was the tumor, mm -hmm. this was the myeloma. Mm -hmm. Then you treat appropriately the patient, and you go, you examine the bone marrow, and there is only 3% plasma cell. The problem is, are these malignant plasma cell, residual malignant plasma cell, or are these the normal plasma cells that you and me have always in the marrow, impossible to make a differentiation by morphology. Mm -hmm. And we, we need more sensitive and specific tools in order to investigate if these residual cells are malignant. And this can be done by two methods. The two methods are immunophenotyping, in other words, by the antigen expression of the plasma cell, we know that the malignant plasma cell have a, a an file, an antigenic signature that is different from that of normal plasma cell, or molecular technique looking for a clo the clonal arrangement of the residual plasma cell. And these techniques are the techniques of minimal residual disease that allow the detection of one malignant plasma cell within 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6, 1 million normal cells. Then this is a high sensitivity for the detection of residual disease. And where does flow cytometry fit in this? Is this the immunophenotyping or okay. molecular technique? Correct. Immunophenotyping. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by flow cytometry, what is flow cytometry? Flow cytometry is a technique that allowed the analysis of thousand millions of cells characterized by the antigenic profile. And you can nowadays, with eight colors simultaneously, staining one cell with eight color different antigens and with high specificity to identify this residual plasma cell. What is the current problem of this? The current problem is that a technique is working very well in the hands of laboratories, but is not available. The, the, the flow cytometry is available in most centers, but mm -hmm. for detection of residual disease, is only available or is only working well in the hands of expertise of the two research labs. For this reason, the Blackstrom project under the umbrella of the International Myeloma Foundation has granted a project, the Black Swan, with the goal, a double goal. The first goal is to standardize the technique. In other words, to make this technique available to all the centers that are treating myeloma patients. And we have almost got it. The second mm. step of the Black Swan and the IMF is just to try to have this technique automatized, similar to what you do when you do a blood test. You take the sample, you put it in, you got the result. You got the level of leukocyte, hemoglobin, and our goal in the black set is to have an automatized system that would allow the people yes to get the sample, the bone marrow sample, to put in the machine, and the machine you have or not. 
residual malignant plasma cell in the bone marrow. And as part of this automated process, I know some people have said, you know, there's eight color staining and there's 12 color staining and there's 24 color staining. And so there's quite a wide variety about the test that's offered and then the results that you're getting back. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about the the progress you've made because you said you've almost got it, which is very exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We worked uh, for a long time with just four color. And I can tell you, the four color, particularly the Spanish and the UK group, has demonstrated now in large series of patients that to have my residual disease, malignant plasma cell, after transplant or after non-transplant treatment with drugs is associated with an adverse prognosis. Moreover, to monitor minimal residual disease will be a, of great help to monitorize the tumor load during consolidation of maintenance phase and probably would allow us just to taper the treatment if the residual disease has gone or to continue the treatment if the residual disease persists. In other words, would allow us to avoid both under or over treatment. Hmm. Then I think this is going to be a critical technique. And this was demonstrated with four. Now, the standard that we want to standardize eight color, 12 could be, but with eight will be enough. And the, the, uh, uh, what I can tell you is that we are very close to have this completely standardized. So what I hear you saying is, is the question you're trying to answer with the MRD testing is, do you keep going with treatment? Have you had enough treatment to satisfy the tumor burden, or is it, you know, do you do you need to keep going? Is that correct? This is this uh, completely correct. This is one one tool. The other tool is to use minimal residual disease the diagnostic factor similar to com to complete response. You know that if, if you receive treatment up front or at relapse, achieve a complete response, your prognosis is much better. Then mm -hmm. I can tell you that if you achieve not only a complete response, but immunophenotypic or a molecular response, the prognostic is even better. Then this is another very important tool of evaluation of residual disease. Well, I would think it would help you choose which therapies you pick, how aggressively you're going to hit it. And when you say it's a prognostic factor, you know you know more of what you're dealing with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is similar to the cytogenetics. Nowadays, cytogenetics has become mandatory because you can identify high-risk patients and you can differentiate from the standard risk. And in the near future, probably, we will... Uh, separate the treatment according to cytogenetics. Similarly, we can separate the treatment uh, probably in the near future according to the level of residual disease after an appropriate treatment. But let me add, you, when I talk about minimal residual disease, I like always to emphasize that minimal residual disease should include the evaluation of the, not only of the bone marrow, but also outside the bone marrow. And for this purpose, in the near future, the PET scan, the CT PET, is going to be also a very important tool for evaluation of minimal residual disease outside the bone marrow. And, and these you, techniques uh -huh. are going to be complementary, one or the other, both. And how frequently are you thinking with the PET scan? The PET scan, uh, again, uh, should be done when you need to make a decision. Imagine that you have, you, you have been treated uh, with what, uh, whatever induction it is, a follow by a transplant, and I think after the transplant will be an ideal moment just to decide, okay, should I go with maintenance for how long? This could be help to have the residual disease evaluation inside and outside the bone marrow. Should I finish the treatment? Please, before I finish the treatment, if I am a patient, I be sure there is no residual disease. Or imagine that I am receiving whatever treatment it is and my residual disease persists and persists. Please change the treatment. 
because mm-hmm. we are not doing the best. Right. And now when you say that it was only available in academic centers and you're trying to automate it so it can be available at, let's say, any lab, is it to that point yet that it's available at any lab at any facility or do you still feel because do you still feel that patients need to go to a myeloma academic center in order to get the right diagnostic testing? Okay. Uh, at, at this timing point, uh, I think uh, it's much better just yes, to go to an academic myeloma center, just yes, to have this test done. And it's mm-hmm. similar. It's better. It's better if you go to an academic myeloma center just yes, to decide what is the best option for you. And you can go to a more a smaller hospital just yes, to receive the treatment, but always under the guidance and the supervision of an academic myeloma center. And I think I want to stress this point because I think sometimes patients will get started with a center that may not have a specialty in myeloma. And um, we are very big proponents of going to see a myeloma specialist. Mm. So what I hear you saying is that you should just um, you should have the guidance and the counsel and the expertise from a myeloma specialist, and then you can get treated anywhere. And I think people need to understand that and know that. Okay, uh, I think this is a very important message, uh, a very important point you have raised. Uh, if I have a multiple myeloma, and uh, and yes, the being was because there was an M component and there was an M spike, I would just to have the best possible assessment of my disease. I would like just to know what is my cytogenetic profile, the genetic profile, uh, the antigen profile of the tumor cells, and if possible, the presence or absence of extramedular disease, according to all these factors, what if or not, or not there is the option of a good clinical trial with some experimental agents that are probably going to demonstrate the superiority. All this information should come from a center is really involved in myeloma. Then, uh, if the the, the the center make the decision and they say, okay, this is the treatment, imagine that this center is 400 kilometers away from where do you live. And in that particular area where do you live, there is a good hospital, good with good hemato or hemato-oncologist that know about myeloma and are prepared just to give you the chemotherapy perfectly well or the, or the new drugs perfectly well under the consortium with that academic center will be ideal. Mm-hmm. You avoid the troublesome of making frequent travels, but at the same time, you are always under the supervision and under the guidance of an expert. Yes, and one of our, our previous interviews said there's that you know, living well is not a matter of convenience, or or living is <laughs> not a matter of convenience. Yeah. You have yeah. to get the care that you need when you need it. Yeah, definitely. Well, can we talk for a little bit about high risk myeloma? Because I know part of this is to identify some of the cytogenetics of the disease, to identify, and then to divide and conquer. I guess to separate out how an individual could be treated most effectively, and then do this MRD testing and know what, you, you, what you're what you working with. So one of the questions okay. that came about from that International Myeloma Working Group um, panel that I saw is is how are levels determined to assess to assess high risk? Okay, it's, I think nowadays we can identify high risk uh, by several, by using several tools. One of the most well accepted is FIS cytogenetics. FIS cytogenetics should be done, should be performed on isolated plasma cells in order to increase the sensitivity of the method. And again, should be performed in, in a lab with really expertise on FIS cytogenetics. There are several abnormalities that, are, that account for adverse prognosis. Abnormalities in 1Q, translocation 440, 17P deletions, hypodiploidy, all these account for an adverse prognosis. But it's not the same to have one 
mm-hmm. as compared to of having two or three. Mm-hmm. Then, and it is possible that one of these abnormalities is just present in a small subclan. All this information is relevant for prognostication. On top of this, we have the international stage system. Stage three is adverse prognosis. High LDH level is an adverse prognosis. The presence of circulating plasma cells that can be detected by flow. This is another major contribution of flow cytometry. Detection of circulating plasma cell, it means more disseminated disease, is also an adverse prognosis. The presence of extramedullary disease detected by PET a diagnosis is also an adverse prognosis. And all these qualify for high risk. And that's determining how far it's spread, basically, right? Yeah. When, you, when you're looking at circulating plasma and cells not, and not, extramedullary... Not, 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 yeah. A, a circulating plasma cells and extramedullary disease reflect how spread is the disease, but not only how it's spread, how resistant could be the cell. Mm-hmm. We are very much interested now in to identify intrinsic resistant and acquired resistant of the cells. And for this purpose, I think the circulating plasma cell are a very good tool for research. So uh, from what I hear you saying, it sounds like we are at the point now where we can not treat everybody everybody as a nail with the, the same hammer. We can treat everybody differently based on their type of disease. So just a follow-up question on that high risk for the 1Q. Um, how many copies of the 1Q are considered amplification? Is it three or more or five or more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but again... I mean, uh, what is very important is not to, uh, to take into account uh, one abnormality mm. uh, because sometimes the coexistence of two or three is what determine to be not only high risk, but ultra high risk. And you're going to treat that differently. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, nowadays, we have not identified a an optimal treatment for the high-risk or ultra-high-risk patients. Uh, and the initial concept that intensive uh, treatment with high-dose therapy should be reserved for the high-risk patient while the standard risk will can do well without the transplant, I think was a mistake. The patients that really benefit from autologous transplant and the standard treatment nowadays with a proton inhibitor and an immune drug are the standard risk. For the high risk, we need to identify different approaches. And unfortunately, we have not yet there. We know that some drugs apparently work better than others in high risk patients. For instance, bortezomib is working pretty well, not excellent, but pretty well in patients with translocation for 14, filsomib as well, pomalidomide probably is valuable in patients with 17 p deletion, but this is a learning process. We are not, as I mentioned, in the position just to make a uh, the best recommendation for high risk, we, ha- we are not there. Mm-hmm. And how do you get there faster? What would help you to get there faster? Because it seems like some of the studies clinical are retrospective. Clinic, yeah. clinic, clinical trials and to work together. I think clinical trials are extremely important. And I know in high risk, it might be more challenging to put together a high risk clinical trial because of just of the number of patients available. But, um, and I haven't seen a lot of, yeah. of separated high risk clinical yeah. trials, but I think high risk patients would love it. <laughs> yeah, you are right. But at least, at least we should stratify the patient at the time of inclusion in the trial into a mm-hmm. standard of high risk in order to have the possibility. Mm-hmm right from the beginning, to look in the high, into the high-risk population, how if they relapse, what type of relapse, what are the markers that pre- predict risk of relapse. For 
substance, I can tell you. If you are high-risk cytogenetics, and after achieving a complete response, you still have very poor prognosis. By contrast, mm -hmm. if you have high-risk cytogenetics, but you achieve a minimal residual disease negative status, your prognosis clearly changes. Mm -hmm. Then I, I, co combining biology with treatment is the way, and this can be done only in clinical trials. So how can you go about um, building clinical trials uh, for high-risk patients? Because I think patients would be very excited about this. As I mentioned, we have two ways to do that. One is on a specific clinical trial for high-risk patients. This could be one possibility. And the second possibility is to try to, to think in what is the best treatment nowadays and to include both high-risk and standard risk and to discriminate, to stratify the patients into these two categories right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Instead of retrospectively, which is kind of what happens now. Uh, retrospectively, retrospectively is what we have been doing so far, and we need now to go, far, to go uh, into the prospective analysis. Oh, I love it. I love it. It's great. Um, are there any high-risk therapies that you think are the best and most effective now? I know you. I know we're not there yet, but are there any that have given you clues or hints besides bortezomib and maybe pomalidomide? I I, I think uh, bortezomib or carfilzomib, pomalidomide, could be a very interesting combination to be tested in high risk patients. Uh, uh, we have data from the uh, retrospective data from the European uh, Consortium. In Italy, Spain, France, and Germany and Holland, in which double otologous transplant was apparently of benefit in high-risk patients, then, I mean, you, if you do a, a clinical trial with carfilzomib, pomalidomide, dexamethasone, followed by double otologous transplant, well, this could be of very interesting, and then to have some consolidation or maintenance with our this will be very important. We are really excited just to see if the new monoclonal antibodies, anti-CD38 or elotuzumab, work in mm -hmm. high-risk patients. And all this interesting data with panobinostat that apparently was of benefit, similar benefit, high and standard risk. Then, I mean, there, there is, there is, uh, this is the time just to try to to, to activate, as you mentioned, this type of clinical trials. Well, okay. I think this is my personal dream come true. I would have, I, I have a high risk feature, and I would have loved to have a clinical trial that was designed, or at least looking at me specifically as a as a certain type. So, and that was my next question: is how do you see all these new immunotherapies working, particularly for high risk? Okay, I, uh, uh, unfortunately, we have no data mm -hmm. yet. But but uh, there is a lot of hope with the new therapies. Let me tell you, I'm a bit old, and when I started to work in multiple myeloma, this was a dessert, only melphalan and prednisone, for more mm -hmm. than 30 years. In fact, the high dose therapy is working on the drug, melphalan, but in 2000, year 2000, it started to change very rapidly. In one mm -hmm. decade, four drugs. In the next mm -hmm. decade, I hope it's again another four drugs. And when I was at the beginning of my medical career, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, I have a cousin that died from acute lymphoblastic leukemia. This girl nowadays would have been cured mm. because acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a curable disease. Same to Hodgkin disease. Let's have the dream that we will evolve in the same direction in multiple myeloma. So you need more patients to participate and what else would be needed to create these these very specific, possibly high-risk clinical trials? 
we, we need uh, patients to participate, and probably what we need is just to get together uh, the different groups and to to make complementary trials, trying to 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 to, to ask questions that could be complemented in Germany, from France or United States or Spain. This, I think, will be very valuable for the patient. Imagine that I test one particular combination, and at the same time, in Italy or in uh, or whatever it is, is another person is testing the same combination plus one immunomodulatory drug. And in his combination, the results are better. Then we have the clue. Yes. And if you can do that simultaneously, it's much faster. Yeah. Well, let me ask you also, because I've seen you've done some work about studying the bone marrow microenvironment, and I can't even say this word, but mm, mesenchymal stromal cells. Yeah. Um, so I have some questions. I, I'm not saying that right, but I, I want to know how you best shut down that myeloma cell support system or what you have found. Okay. Uh, currently, it's well known that cancer is not only a problem of the tumor cell, but also to the difficult word that you mentioned, the microenvironment. Okay. It is mainly uh, driven by the mesenchymal cells, but also the T and NK cells, the accessory cells. If we talk to the mesenchymal cells, in, in trying to understand if mesenchymal cells from myeloma patient are similar or different from normal mesenchymal cells. And I can tell you that mesenchymal cells from the bone marrow of myeloma patient are differently, are genetically different from the normal mesenchymal cells and if you put in culture myeloma cells with mesenchymal cells from patients versus the same co-culture of tumor cells, but with mesenchymal cells from normal donors, the co-culture, the mesenchymal cells from the patients give a proliferative advantage to the tumor cells and give different genetic signals then we know nowadays that by sure this of the myeloma also play a role in tumor development. So I have a question about that. If you say they're genetically different, are you saying, I, I know a myeloma patient versus a normal person, is it the same as a, let's say, a no. myeloma patient who is in remission no. versus a normal person's? Mesenchymal, mesenchymal cells? We, we have not looked uh, uh, to the analysis in remission patients, and this is a, a, a good idea. You have given me one idea for the weekend. I will think in this analysis. But uh, what I can tell you is that the, mesen the, the genetic abnormalities that we have observed in the patient mesenchymal cells are not related at all to the uh, genetic abnormalities that we identify in the plasma cells. In other mm. words, in the mesenchymal cells, you have no translocation for 14, you have no 17 p deletion, you have no one gains. This is, are different, are more subtle genetic abnormalities. Okay, yeah, they're support system, they're support cells, right? So they're they're not yeah. going to have the myeloma indicators necessarily, but maybe other okay. indicators. Yes, that's well. I would love to know what you find out about that because you wonder if patients who are in remission and have these um, these very pesky cells that are still remaining, even if you're MRD negative, that you have a support system that's in place that's still going to be conducive to growing that myeloma at a later time. Yeah. Kind of related to that, here's a here's another question for you. At the resistant myeloma stem cells, is there any new information about the stage at which they become resistant? I saw that you were working or had worked on a paper that showed 
that showed that you were studying CD138 and um, like a heightened or they call it CD138++ and then a 138 low and um, showing that there was no no difference. And I'd have to go back and read that again um, okay. after I wrote this I would question down. To explain to you, but, okay. <laughs> I would say to explain to you, but I, I, as soon as we finish this conversation, Jenny, let me talk to you just to offer a position in our team. Mm -hmm. Be because you know about multiple myeloma so much that I will offer you a position for research. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. This story, uh, we were suggest to try to identify uh, which were the uh, stem cell for multiple myeloma. And some people claim that the myeloma stem cell uh, was a CD20 positive cell. By definition, most of the myeloma cells are CD20 negative. CD20 is a B cell antigen, okay? And mm -hmm. most myeloma, uh, the myeloma cell, the malignant myeloma cell, lose 20 antigen, usually. By contrast, the, the B cell, are CD20, the normal B cell, are CD20, and some people claim it. That probably the precursor of the myeloma cell is a, is a, is a B lymphocyte CD20 that evolved into a CD20 negative mature plasma cell. This was the theory. And also, some people claim that CD138, that is a marker for plasma cell, if it's weak expression, it, 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 it disidentifies immature plasma cell, while a, a strong expression identifies the mature plasma cell. Then we will concentrate in these two populations, the CD20 positive and the CD138 negative or low positive. That would correspond, in other words, to theoretically, the precursors of the myeloma. And we have performed a lot of experiments in animal models, etc., just to try to identify the cl clonogenic capacity of these two populations. And what I can tell you is that from a point of view, the stem cell, the precursor cell, are not inside of this population because the clonogenic capacity the same tumor dissemination capacity as the mature clone. Hmm. I know a lot of people are trying to go backwards and see, um, you know, at this, this, I guess, progenitor cell or earlier stage, where is the myeloma happening? And yeah. that's the goal. And so do you have any other insight about yeah, why we, we, myeloma keeps yeah. coming back? <laughs> Yeah, we uh, our our, uh, our research now is focusing on two tools in order to better understand the biology of myeloma. One is to get the cells in minimal residual disease, because by definition, these minimal residual diseases are resistant and are responsible of the relapse and mm -hmm. have clonogenic capacity. And the other uh, group of cells that we are currently investigating are the circulating plasma cells. So, or, or, or research is focusing very strongly in these two cell populations, the MRD and the circulatory. Because they're more aggressive? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. Well, I want to leave some time for caller questions, but are there some clinical trials? I see you have several open clinical trials. Are there some you'd like to discuss or share before we go to caller questions? Okay, uh, there are uh, the clinical trial that we are going to activate. Uh, as you know, we uh, conducted a clinical trial with myeloma, with an alidomide dexamethasone that has shown that early treatment in high risk smoldering, only in high risk smoldering, uh, is associated with a benefit in, in, in time to progression and a benefit in overall survival. Basically, we are just in the process of activating another clinical trial for high-risk smoldering with the aim, the goal, is to use persistent MRD negativity. In other words, we want to cure these patients. Mm -hmm. And what will that trial include? This trial will include induction with CRD, carfilzomib, and alidomide. Followed by transplant, followed by consolidation with CRD, 
follow it by maintenance with the analyte Very uh, uh, heavy treatment for a high risk smoldering, but we hope that we can, we will be able to cure a substantial number of patients. Mm -hmm. This is the goal. This is the. Thing. And when you say high risk smoldering, are you looking at a specific like a deletion seventeen or or everything that you talked about earlier in the high risk category? Every, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. everything we talk about. Okay. Well, I'm so happy that you're working on the high risk group and that there's so much detail behind it and that you're looking to segment people. I think that's been a long time in coming. I'm thrilled that it's here. And um, whatever we can do in terms of helping to accrue patients in those groups, we've created these Facebook groups that are subdivided by translocation so that people can, with those can join and then be really aware of what's happening for their particular kind of myeloma. Definitely. Well, I would like to open it up for caller questions. So if you have a question for Dr. San Miguel, please call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And we have um, many questions for you. So we will start with our first caller at 685-2380. Go ahead with your question. Yes, hi. Good afternoon, Dr. San Miguel and Jenny. This is Dana Holmes. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, Dr. Miguel, I, I have a question for you. I'm a smoldering patient, so I'm um, thrilled to hear that you're continuing your work with the smoldering population and uh, looking at additional trials. Uh, the trial that you just mentioned sounded similar to me. Uh, I think the University of Chicago is actually using that for newly diagnosed myeloma patients. Um, right. I have a smoldering group on Facebook, and one of the gals who actually um, thought she was smoldering, actually is newly diagnosed, and she's in that trial. The, the CRD followed by the, um, the stem cell then followed by CRD consolidation with REV. So that's exciting to know that you're moving that into the smoldering group as well. Um, it it yeah. sounds like a, a, a curia, curative approach. Um, how would you best evaluate someone with smoldering myeloma? Obviously, okay. uh, you would use the, the flow cytometry that you're speaking yeah. about, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's critical when the smoldering. Most the smoldering myeloma patients are low or standard risk, and I never will treat such a patient. What the, 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 the only patients that are candidate, from my point of view, for embarking in clinical trials and no treatment, uh, uh, treatment outside clinical trials for a smoldering patient, but for a smoldering with high risk, this, and I'm going to talk about what high risk this is in a smoldering, I would consider to include them in clinical trial. Again, no outside clinical trial. Then, if we focus on high risk, what is I consider high risk? I consider high risk smoldering those patients that have more than three grams deciliter of the component plus more than 10% plasma cells and ideally if this plasma cell if the total by flow are phenotypically aberrant in other words all the plasma cells are clonal this is what with that when more than 95% of the total are clonal this is associated with high risk of progression. On top of that, new data that the presence of high number of circulating plasma cells, we are working on this, the presence of high risk epigenetics defined as stress location for 14 or so, can qualify for high risk smoldering. Oh, thank you so much for clarifying that. Ple that's, that's important to the Ple smoldering community because we, we have that gray area. Yeah. We're not quite sure. Who's oh, who and where yeah. we fit in? Oh, please, uh, if I would be an a smoldering patient with low risk, I never will accept nowadays a treatment because the chances of progression are very low. If I am an, an intermediate risk, I will not go for treatment. And if I have a high risk, I will discuss with my doctor the possibility of being included in a clinical trial, but in the context in the, uh, of high risk only. Okay. Thank you. And Dr. Miguel, 
how useful is a plasma cell labeling index compared oh, to the, the flow cytometry tests that you use? Okay. The, 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 I think the labeling index, the old fashion of the labeling index, is, is a troublesome, and we prefer just to use the flow. The flow. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what do you, what are your thoughts about the um, multi-peptide vaccine to induce cytoxic T cells? Uh, it, this is the vaccine that's being run out of um, Dana Farber and Mass General, uh, and it's going to be coupled with a short-term dosing of Red, about three months worth of, of Rev. Do you think that that holds promise for the smoldering community? Yes, yes, I think. Uh completely convinced that the immune system play a, a very important role not in not only in myeloma in all cancer in all the this, uh, this type of disease and uh, the era is that was almost abandoned for the, in the last five years now is re-emerging and is uh, not only because we have new drugs that work in the immunotherapy area but also because we have tools that can exploit the, their own TNNK cells. And in fact, some of the immunomodulatory drugs work through this mechanism by enhancing the, the TNNK cell activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what I understand, that that peptide vaccine yeah. actually and does. Vaccination, vaccination looks into this direction. Yeah. Okay. And um, lastly, I don't want to take up all of your time, but what imaging diagnostics are important for those with smoldering myeloma? Do we need PET for, CT scans? Uh, for the Do we need MRI? For, the, for, for the smoldering myeloma, my current recommendation is to perform a, an MRI of the spine plus a low-dose CT. This is my recommendation. Very good. Dr. McGill, thank you so much. I'd like to Pleasure. apply for for one of those junior research jobs in your lab someday too. <laughs> Don't doubt. Would love Don't to, doubt. Would love to come over and and, and work and, and learn more from you. It's a fascinating interview today. Thank you so much for your time and, and your knowledge and for Pleasure. what you do. Pleasure. All right. Thank you for your question. Okay. Our next caller will um, call our question is at seven five eight four one six four. Go ahead with your question. Yes, hi, Dr. Miguel. Uh, my name is uh, Laura Casey, and my husband um, is a high risk with 414 and deletion 13, but that was not discovered until after transplant. Um, he did have the cytogenetic testing done, uh, but it, you know, it showed up as normal. Uh, so he he was on a clinical trial. He did um, three cycles of RVD. He was in a partial remission uh, when he had the stem cells collected. Then he did the cyclophosphamide and the high-dose melphalan in the transplant. His M-spike was the same, exact same after the transplant. Um, two more cycles of RVD and then went to the Revlimid maintenance. Um, two weeks on maintenance, he, his numbers went, went crazy up again. Um, so he's now on uh, Typolis, Pomelis, and Dex, starting his sixth cycle of that. So I guess a couple of things. Um, the, so I, I think, you know, horses out of the barn, um, I think, but I've since learned that, um, or in my reading, that with the 414, probably, um, you know, it would have been better to do a bortezomib type of maintenance. Uh, or and, and I guess my other question is, you know, should his uh, numbers have been a little bit lower before collecting those stem cells and going into the transplant? I, I listened to a talk by Dr. Uh, Loniel out of Emory, and he said the high-dose melphalan um, for a high-risk patient can be like putting gas on a fire. So... I guess I have a lot of questions. One is, you know, right now his numbers are coming down. The, those, the drugs seem to be working. So, you know, can he overcome, you know, the situation that happened prior to that? Uh, and would you recommend another transplant? Uh, I guess 
you know, those are a couple of my questions anyway. Okay, okay. First of all, let me tell you, for 414, I think uh, both bortezomib and hyperolis, carfilzomib, are very attractive drugs. Okay. And probably the kyprolis uh, 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 is good, if not better than bortezomib in this patient with 414. Uh, we are not yet uh, the data, but at least I would say that will be equivalent. I would expect that. Okay, then I think it's a good, uh, a very good choice. Okay. Second, second, the the, the point of uh, putting gas to risk. This I I, I not uh, I am I don't think this is a correct statement, and the reason is because uh, the, is, uh, the the European study that included the largest number of patients so far reported in the world uh, based on the meta-analysis of the French, Italian, Spanish, German, and, and Dutch trials all together has demonstrated that the best for patients with high risk 414 and 17P tandem pathologous transplant. Then I am not sure that the statement that is put in fuel into into uh, uh, I am uh, I, I don't think is the 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 the, 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 the correct statement. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and but but in the case of your husband, I would not repeat now a transplant because the first one had not value. Then right. I would not repeat the transplant. And finally. Regarding your point about collection of stem cells at that time in point, the problem in myeloma is not the number of plasma cells that you infuse, the number of tumor cells that you may infuse with a transplant. The problem is the cells that are residual inside of the patients and has not been able to be eradicated with a high dose malfalan. This is the problem. It's not infusion. The problem is what is inside. And I think your husband should be also of a, a, a myeloma center because now we have nowadays we have several alternative drugs also such as the this okay. etc that could be of interest for him. So I guess that was because obviously you know eventually these drugs will stop working. Um, so I guess that's yeah. you know yeah, the yeah, next yeah, question yeah. is, is the at point. that point what is the next you know yeah. um, what would yeah. you recommend after that? Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. So, oh, so I'm, is your I'm question? Sorry, so what would you recommend? Guess, what, what would you recommend yeah, after so that? Yeah. So, what would what would be the recommendation after the these three drugs run their course, and and what kind of testing should we be making sure is done to, um, other than just the you know it, it, looking at the M spike? If 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 I understand correctly, uh, your husband now is receiving kyprolis plus lenalidomide dexamethasone. Is this correct? Uh, Kyprolis, polist, and dexamethasone, yes. Yeah. Then one alternative is to move into the monoclonal antibodies, anti-CD38. Okay. This is uh, probably uh, the, the first choice that I will think about, particularly, and I'm if, sorry, you said is, particular, particularly if it's in combination with lenalidomide or bortezomib. So, it could be within a monoclonal antibody. And there are several okay. ongoing clinical trials in that direction. And I will okay. evaluate, in the case of your husband, I think it's important just to evaluate the residual disease outside the bone of extramedullary disease. So, a pet, so he has never had a yeah. PET CT. Yeah, probably. You, you, would, yeah. you would recommend that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. and I'm sorry, I, I heard the monoclonal antibodies. Did you say a, a CDC38? Yes, CD1, uh, C, CD38. CB38, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you Great so show. much. Now, I have one question that was emailed in by Susie Rose, who says, can flow cytometry indicate if a progenitor cell population was killed off? And then if so, who does the test? Is it biopsy or serum? Um, when would it be done? After consolidation, induction, or should it be used as a monitoring tool for maintenance? Okay, flow cytometry is always performed in bone marrow specimen. 
is a technique okay. for bone marrow, or uh, peripheral blood in the case of the circulating plasma cells. And this, uh, the, the, the flow is done, uh, uh, can be done at diagnosis, also after induction or after consolidation therapy. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, we have one more caller question at 557-6827. Okay, go ahead with your question. Eh, buenos días, doctor San Miguel. Eh, yes. mi, mi pregunta es la siguiente, le llamo porque quisiera saber cómo es que los pacientes que no viven en los Estados Unidos pueden tener acceso al mejor tratamiento para mi, mieloma. Bueno, pues eh, en nuestro centro, por ejemplo, tenemos todos estos fármacos de los que estamos hablando. En, en la Universidad de Navarra tenemos eh, acceso a todos estos fármacos porque tenemos muchos clinical trial. El... Ah, me refería, por ejemplo, en, en México, en otros países en, en Latinoamérica. Porque los fármacos nuevos están, la mayoría, todavía en clinical trials. Ok. Okay. I think I think those are those are the key, aren't they? <laughs> Clinical trials okay. Okay. are the, are yes. the key to get the very best yeah. in care. Yeah. Okay, we have one more call question. Three 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 yeah, one. I think it probably will be the, the 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 last one or two question because I have. This is uh, no. This is the last question. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry to take your time. Three three one eight eight four zero. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we will we will just thank you Dr. San Miguel for joining us today. We absolutely love what you are doing for high-risk patients. Uh, we love the approach. We love what you're testing for so we can separate everything out. Uh, we're just so very grateful for your leadership and your research to move the field forward as quickly as possible. We are so appreciative of your time today. No, it has been a pleasure really. Always the patience is the driving for a doctor. And in this case, the myeloma patients are my driving. Okay. Mm. Well, thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you Bye. for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we as patients can help drive to a cure for myeloma by joining clinical trials. Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of The Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play The Godfather now at ChompaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VGW Group, no purchase necessary. Avoid where prohibited by law. See terms and conditions, 18 plus.